One of the things we teach during the gas law unit is relative rates of diffusion of gases. I'm going to show you a relatively easy way to have students do this demonstration or do this as a lab rather than you do it as a demonstration. I do it actually as a series, is one of a series of stations. It's not the whole focus of the lab. It's just one of the things that the students do. Most of us have had the experience of putting uh, Q-tips in two ends of a big glass tube and measuring where the white line shows up. Well, this is something students can do at, their, at the lab tables and they can do individually rather than doing it as a demonstration. I find that it doesn't always show up too well when you're trying to show a whole classroom of students. I avoid calling it Graham's Law, even though that's what teachers have been calling it for a long time, because this is not effusion of a gas, which is the escape of a gas through a small pinhole into a vacuum. This is diffusion through air. There are a lot of similarities to it, and the relative rate should still be that the heavier gas is going to move more slowly than the lighter gas. I don't tell the students this ahead of time, but um, I just want to avoid calling it Graham's Law. All right, first of all, I'm going to talk about the two gases that we're going to use and what I would tell the students and then what I'm going to tell you as a teacher. The two gases we're going to use are hydrogen chloride and ammonia. The thing is they don't come in gaseous form. They come to us in solution form. The solution that we call hydrochloric acid is the gas hydrogen chloride dissolved in and reacted with water to make an acid. So I have my hydrochloric acid and what I do, I do this in the hood, is I set up a beaker and I put in it an upside down uh, pipette and a big warning, don't, you're not supposed to turn the pipette in the other direction. You're supposed to leave it upside down unless you're using it. I keep this in the hood. Students bring their cotton swabs to the hood to put the drops on and then take them back to their table. This is concentrated hydrochloric acid. Now, I've only got a little bit in the pipette. There's just a small amount in the bulb, so I'm not too worried about spills. When it's empty, I can put some more in. I don't have to keep a large amount of hydrochloric, concentrated hydrochloric acid out for the students. Okay. Also in the hood, but widely separated from the hydrochloric acid, I have the same setup for my ammonia, and I have, have the pipettes labeled. I have a little bit of ammonia water in the, te in the barrel pipette, and I leave that in the hood on the other side. And I monitor the hood. I don't need to monitor the students' lab desks. I monitor the hood. I stand between them. The students come to me on either side to put their drops on their cotton swabs. Now, when we have uh, oh, one thing, another comment is that this ammonia in here is actually a solution of ammonia gas in water. It's not really ammonium hydroxide because the ammonium ions and the hydroxide ions are never together in the solution. And the equilibrium lies far to the side of the ammonia gas aqueous. So the ammonia is dissolved in the solution. It's really not ammonium hydroxide. Okay, let's go to the board now and see what reaction we're going to have here. We're going to use the gaseous form of these two compounds. Right now, the rest of the pipette is already filled with that gas because the gases have already probably come out of solution somewhat. And we have hydrogen chloride, not hydrochloric acid at this point because we're talking only about the gas, not the liquid. And we have ammonia gas. The students, if they've learned They've probably learned Bronsted or Arrhenius acids and bases at this point. And Arrhenius acid has to have a hydrogen ion when dissolved in water. Well, we've got the hydrogen, but we don't have the dissolved in water, so this is not an Arrhenius acid at this point. It's not going to act as one in the gaseous form. And an Arrhenius base has to produce a hydroxide in water. Well, we don't even have a hydroxide here, and again, it's not an aqueous solution. But what we have when we combine these two in their gaseous form is we actually get a Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction. And what's going to happen in a Bronsted-Lowry reaction is that the acid is going to donate its hydrogen to the base. And the base, in this case, is the ammonia molecule. 
it's going to readily accept that hydrogen ion because of its unshared pair of electrons. So this is going to act as the base. And the product then will be HNH3. Ah, that's too awkward. Let's just call that NH4 because we're familiar with the ammonium ion. And of course, the chloride has to go somewhere. And since this is not an aqueous solution, it'll show up as a solid. Okay, they are not going to be dissolved ions. They are going to be in their solid form. Okay, so let's see how we can see this. Um, one thing I will do for the students sometime um, up front before they start this uh, is show them that when we get, and the reason these keeping these separate from each other is when we get them together, we often see a cloud, and that cloud is the solid particles that are forming in the air. Okay, I'm not going to do that part right now because I think that's going to obscure what we're going to see. Two students in a group, one student's in charge of the hydrogen chloride cotton swab, one student's in charge of the ammonium cotton, ammonia cotton swab, and they come back to the hood to fill them. And then they have to go back to their seats and si or back to their lab table and simultaneously put the cotton swabs in this straw that they have taped to their desk. Now, I have not put the solutions on the swabs yet. I make the students practice before they do it. They get their swabs simultaneously. They have to put it in the end of the straw. And I make them do it until they feel very comfortable with it. I don't want them walking around with ammonia and hyd hydrogen chloride on their swabs and fumbling. Now they're going to anyway probably, but all right. So what do they do when they come to the hood? They've got their pipette, they've got their swab, and very carefully with me watching because I don't leave the hood in this case, they're going to put a few drops on the end of their swab and the point is to get back to their seat quickly. Now being only one person here, I'm going to set that aside while I do my other one. They would be doing this at the same time and having already practiced putting it in the straw. They should be pretty good at it. Okay, I don't want to spill that. I'm going to take my cotton swabs and I'm going to put them in the straw and I'm going to wait. Now what we'll see, and some of you may be already familiar with this, is as the gases diffuse across the straw, when they meet, they should make a white line you may be able to see right now the white solid being looking like smoke in the air. I think what we're seeing there is just condensation. And we should get a nice white line right here. Okay, are we seeing it? Okay, now I've had, are we getting two white lines? I think that, all right. Of, People before have uh, measured this and tried to derive uh, Graham's law from this. I don't like to do that because this really isn't Graham's law. But um, what we should see, and we do, is that the white line is closer to the heavier gas, the hydrogen chloride, than it is to the lighter gas, the ammonia. And that's the point of this. I really don't have them measure it because it's really not a valid assessment of Graham's law. I want them just to see conceptually that uh, the heavier gas is going to take more time to diffuse than the lighter gas, so when they meet, they're closer to the heavier gas. And that's how I do the relative rates of diffusion of gases.